And welcome to the Sports Desk, excuse me, the UC and Herbie Show here on Herbie Sports Radio. I'm Chris Idell filling in uh, my partner in crime, Yuski Ewan, is on a mini vacation this week because his brother's in town. So if he's watching us, thanks for joining. Thanks for tuning in, uh, Ewan's brother uh, from Tampa. Hope you're safe and well from all these uh, um, the pandemic going on. Wait, I am waiting for my broadcast partner to join us, uh, who's filling in Matt Treconelli, but I guess he is um, behind the schedule. But tonight is going to be a great show here on the program. We got some. We're going to talk AA. See, uh, American Athletic Conference. We got Tulsa up on the show right now with uh, Kelly Hines, who writes for the Tulsa, you know, Golden Hurricanes. So, uh, hi Kelly, thanks for coming on tonight. I'm doing everything solo this evening, so uh, so uh, thanks for coming on. Talk about uh, Tulsa. Tulsa last year had a tough season, four and eight on, on you know, four and eight overall. You know, what do they have to do this year to get better? Because I know their schedule, they have Oklahoma State, they have to go down the turnpike. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it hinges on the offense, you know, taking another step, um, uh, in particular the offensive line, which was a little bit shaky last year. So um, I think there are a lot of tools there on offense with um, just about everybody back, um, all the skilled players back. So I think that, you know, given um, quarterback play has been an issue in, in years past, that's certainly made a difference in um, the results in, in the win-loss column. But I think um, with Zach Smith um, going into, you know, his third year in the system, um, he's going to be the guy again. Um, and, and this is kind of his team to lead. So I, I think there are definitely some um, key pieces there on offense, and it's just going to be a matter of putting it all together. Well, let me welcome in my partner who is finally here. So, uh, Matt, are you uh, are you there? Uh, yes, yes, I am. All right. Thanks for coming on tonight, buddy. Uh, Kelly Hines, who writes for the uh, Tulsa World News out there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was pretty busy last weekend with the uh, with the Donald Trump thing going on. So has, has uh, Tulsa recovered from that? Yeah, I think so. It was kind of a, a weird day for sure. And I, I helped with the coverage of that, even though I'm you know, typically a sports writer. They had me help out. And that was a, a memorable sort of thing that happened Um not as much of a turnout as, as they expected, uh, but you know there is still a pandemic going on, and um, it's it was it was an experience for sure. Let's talk about this pandemic coming up, and I know Matt Matt wanted to chime in with this. Do uh, you see football playing right as of September fifth against uh, Toledo, or you feel like it's going to be delayed a little bit because all these schools are getting affected now with the virus? You know, I know Oklahoma went down with five and. Clemson went down with 23 because everybody's probably doing all the social injustice things. So how do you feel like that's going to be an issue for throughout July and August? You know, certainly around here, the numbers are going up um, and that's pretty alarming, um, particularly when you look at the stats for the 18 to 50 year old, uh, that, that demographic that a lot of the, you know, all of the football team is in, most of the coaches are in that. So um, I think that there's still going to be football. Um, I just don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Are there going to be fewer fans, no fans? Um, is it going to be, you know, players have to be tested before every game? If so, that's going to get extremely expensive very fast. And then Pulse as a program that has a lot of budget issues, you know, in, in a normal year. So when you are looking at $70 per test, per athlete, per time, I mean, that's, that's just thousands upon thousands of dollars that, you know, I think that like they are willing to come up with the money for, but that's, they're going to take a huge hit financially if, if there is a, a normal football season, but I still think there's going to be a, a football season, whether that's normal. I, I think that remains to be seen. Matt, do you have any uh, chime in on that? Um, I mean, that was a question I was going to ask, so no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's go on with the uh, – let's talk about the quarterback from uh, – for you guys, you got a uh, Baylor transfer. You know, he came over you know, a couple years ago, three years ago. Um, his name is Zach Smith. So uh, what type of quarterback is Zach? Because he, he comes from a Baylor offense. And I know in Baylor, at, when he was with Baylor, he was probably with Matt Rule. Or, or probably Art Bryles, whatever, in, in between those two coaches. What does he bring to a Tulsa offense? You know, he's more of a, a pure pocket passer, not a, a super mobile guy. Um, I think that when he has 
time to throw. He's typically on the money, um, but, you know, he was sacked 39 times last year. A lot of that was just because the offensive line was was not that good. Um, I, I do think that he needs to, uh, you know, speed up things, you know, to, to allow himself, um, you know, to avoid those sacks. And, you know, when you're not a super mobile guy, that, that can be an issue. So he, if his guys, if his targets are covered, and um, pressure is on, I, I think it, it, it creates some bad situations for him. So that's when, you know, you really need to see the offensive line take a, a pretty substantial step, um, you know, from last year to, to this year. Yeah. Um, this American Conference, is it basically Central Florida's uh, division, uh, division title to win or lose? Or you feel like there's other teams coming out of this conference because you got Navy – down where we are, we're going to do Navy in a couple of minutes, you know, here in Annapolis, you know, down here in Maryland. Do you feel like those two are the ones that are going to be fighting for who's going to go to that Power 5 bowl game? Man, I, I think that it's just – it's. I wouldn't say it's wide open, but I think there are so many good teams in the American, um, you know, just in, in Tulsa's division when you look at, um, you know, Houston, SMU, Memphis, even Tulane is, is getting um, its program going – and Navy is always there too. I mean, being, uh, you know, with an extremely good veteran coach, they're, they're going to be competitive also. Um, I, I think that in just in the West, that's, that's going to be a really tough division for Tulsa. I'm sure they're going to be picked last again. And, and I think it's going to be hard for them to finish above that. And then, you know, in the East division and Cincinnati, UCF, I, I don't know. I, I think that there are just so many good teams in the, in the American and, um, you know, it's it's just going to be uh, a real challenge for for programs like Tulsa to to be able to to finish near the top. I guess now there won't be divisions. What am I saying? I keep yeah. forgetting UConn's gone. But you know, I, I think yeah. that um, regardless, it's so tough to to be in that top half. Um, you know, it's just it's really difficult to um, make substantial moves from season to season when everybody is getting better. That everybody's replacing and reloading. And when you're a program like Tulsa that's been, you know, near the bottom for several years, you have to figure out how to make a huge jump in one season. Yeah. Let's talk about UConn real quick. And you know, they're now going to be independent. You know, they, they left to go to the Big East basketball. You know, is that going to hurt the conference without having a uh, UConn or basically UConn? So, you know, not, you know, a factor that's going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it really matters for football other than it, you know, with things moving to like an odd number that that plays a role. But I think for basketball is where it hurts more because you don't have um, as many programs with that high level, you know, basketball history that UConn had. But Mm -hmm. I know that like from Tulsa's perspective, like to not have to go all the way to Connecticut for, you know, uh, really every sport like that's that's something that probably didn't need to be happening anyway. So um, I, I think it's probably best that UConn is moving on. Um, there are definitely some interesting um, basketball games between UConn and Tulsa. Um, but, you know, I, I think in terms of women's basketball, like you definitely lose like the top program uh, yeah. in like women's college basketball history, but it also opens up things for other programs to, you know, win some conference titles and get into the tournament. Yeah. Hey Matt, do you have any uh, questions for uh, for Kelly Hines? Um, so I just have like a general question with like the college football playoff and stuff. Who do you think would be the possible four teams that might get into it? Oh man, <laughs> it's, it's too early for me to start thinking about that. But you know, I, I uh, being from Oklahoma, you know, I definitely think that Oklahoma is going to be in the mix again. Um, that's a program that's extremely well coached, and just man, they can lose. A couple Heisman quarterbacks back to back, and then just continue to replace them. So I think that that's a, a program that's going to be there. And then you know you have to look at at the ones that are always going to be in the mix, and w- with Clemson and Alabama, and you know even LSU with with everything that they've lost, if if they can continue to to replace those guys, I, I think it's going to be a lot of the same programs that have been in the mix um, in the last few years. Do you think that possibly uh, Texas could get in? I mean, yeah, I think that's possible. I, I think that Texas is is not quite as back as it is as it wants to think that it is. But you know, I, I do think that Tom Herman is a, is a really good coach, and they managed to get five star guys. So you know, at some point, I do think it's going to be put all together. I just don't know if that's going to be this year. Yeah. 
Well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on. I hope your family is safe from this uh, pandemic stuff. Hope everything is this, this little spike will go away and we we'll get ready for some football. And uh, if, it, if we have fans and if we don't have fans, and we're still going to be playing. And the good thing is baseball is playing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that is good. I, I, I think that things are going to – we'll have some sports, but I don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah. I just hope they get the minor league system up, but I think it's yeah. too late for minor league baseball. Yeah, it's definitely going to make it a longer summer here without minor league baseball, but we'll get yeah. through it. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. And you're, uh, you know, let me put your uh, Twitter handle up so people can follow you if they want to get all the good insights of, uh, you know, the uh, of the uh, of the Tulsa Hurricanes. Yeah, that's your that's your Twitter handle, right, Kelly yep, Hines at EW. All it. right. Well, have a great Fourth of July, and thanks for coming on. Oh, no problem. Anytime, guys. I'll see y'all. Yep, thanks a lot. Take care. All right, folks. That's, uh, that's Kelly Hines, who uh, writes for the Tulsa um, Golden Hurricanes. I don't know if you want to call them golden, because you know they have another hurricane, Matt, down in uh, Carl Gables. So they yeah. might have a little issue. What if those two teams play each other? Hurricanes versus Hurricanes. Which one would you pick? Well, let's see. I would have to go with the U, which is Miami University, uh, University of Miami. For sure. Exactly. Yeah, I, I have to go with the U too, or else, uh, or else I have to deal with somebody who uh, lives twenty-five minutes away from me and who may have to have some, uh, some. We might have a sit-down conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So. Coming up in three minutes, we got uh, Billy Wagner who covers for covers the Navy midshipmen for the Capital Gazette down there in Annapolis, and he just logged on right now. So let's get him on because I know he's a busy man. So, uh, Bill, are you ready? I'm ready. If you are, how are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Thanks for coming on tonight. I know you're a, a guy dying for some sports. <laughs> you know we're. Uh, where we're all dying for, yeah. Now we're getting baseball coming back for sixty games. You know that's a, that's going to be a very interesting, uh, you know, summer. So uh, let's talk about Navy. Uh, what does Navy uh, this year uh, got to do? Last year they came off uh, eleven and two, nice win in the bowl game. You know now they got a new quarterback issue coming up with who's going to be taking it on for Malcolm Perry, right? Right. Well, if you looked at the major turnaround that Navy had, and obviously it was one of the greatest turnarounds in. FBS history as far as going from a, a three and eight, I believe, or three and nine the year before to to uh, eleven and two was a dramatic turnaround. And you have to say two two things that were absolutely crucial to that. You had Malcolm Perry playing quarterback at an incredibly high level and being an amazing playmaker, and you had Brian Newberry took over as defensive coordinator and made a just an amazing difference with what he was doing defensively. So. Those two factors were crucial. Well, they dodged a bullet. Uh, Mississippi State, Mike uh, uh, Leach, tried to hire Newberry away, and he ultimately chose to stay at the Naval Academy, which was a huge save for the program. And then, obviously, Malcolm Perry was uh, drafted in the NFL by the Miami Dolphins. Replacing him at quarterback is going to be a much more difficult challenge. Yeah, because Perry could beat you with his arm and his legs, and I think that's what Ken, uh, Coach uh, Ken Munotuo wanted to have. You know, a quarterback is mobile, and you know, you could throw that touchdown pass or run it in the end zone. Right. Well, and I mean, he was just a he was a threat to go all the way at any time, and the the defense had to respect him. And the the threat of Malcolm Perry made every other element of the option offense so much, you know, better. The fullback, the slot back, etc. So they've got to try to find a dynamic quarterback. They've got Perry Olsen was the backup last year, and he got into about eight games and actually saw fairly significant action against Notre Dame. That game got out of hand early in the second half, and so Perry came in about midway through the third quarter and finished out the game, actually led Navy on a couple touchdown drives. Now it was against Notre Dame's reserves, so it's difficult to judge. So Perry's a, a solid quarterback, but he's not – the home run threat. If you have a triple option offense where the quarterback has the ball in his hands on every play and is so critical to every play, you really need a dangerous dynamic threat there. And Navy's had several people that fit that mold. 
Keenan Reynolds, uh, obviously Ricky Dobbs. We can go on and on naming some of the great triple option quarterbacks. But, you know, Malcolm Perry was as uh, dynamic a runner as Navy's ever had at any position. So uh, you're not going to replace Malcolm Perry, but they would like to find someone who is of a similar mold in terms of being a dynamic, dangerous runner, which is why they're considering moving Chance Warren from wide receiver to quarterback because he is uh, he kind of it fits that dynamic playmaker type you know role. Mm-hmm. Well, Bill, I got a question to ask you. Speaking of Notre Dame, uh, big game coming up week one. He's supposed to be over in Ireland. Now it's moved over to uh, to Annapolis, the capital of uh, Maryland. What and how did they move this thing over? And how is this whole thing going to work out? Because we, you and I, have been down to Navy and Marine Court Stadium. It's a traffic nightmare, even there for, for lacrosse games or or a football game. How are they going to get? Are they going to be a playing with fans or or be with nobody around? Well, they're uncertain how many fans, but the the maximum capacity of Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium is thirty eight thousand. That was the record crowd for an Air Force game. There will not be 38,000 people in the stands. Uh, it's more likely going to be 10,000 is kind of my guess. Uh, there is a chance it may only be the Brigade of Midshipmen, 4,500 strong, or it could it be none. Uh, so I'm guessing somewhere in the range of ten to 15,000. Uh, it's going to be a unique event. As you know, Notre Dame has never played Navy in Annapolis. The game – and its entire history has either been played at in South Bend or it's been at some neutral site location, usually an NFL stadium. And that's because of the, the demand for its tickets. It, you know, they, you can get 70,000 fans for a Navy Notre Dame game. So that's why they don't play at Navy Marine Corps. You'd be turning away 35,000 fans. So uh, in this instance, because of the situation, they can play in Annapolis because they're not going to need a large capacity. So, it, let's say it is 10,000 or 15,000 fans. You can guarantee the ticket price is going to be astronomical. 500 probably for the cheapest seats. Matt, you want to chime in on that? Matt? Yeah, well, so with that being said and stuff, so with Notre Dame playing uh, Navy the first game of the season, so how how is this going to impact Navy and how are they going to prepare for that game? Because usually usually Navy has – several games so they can see Notre Dame's like offense and defense. So how would that impact Navy? Oh, it's not ideal at all. Normally Navy plays Notre Dame in November, which, you know, you could also say that playing them in November is tough because you're beaten up, you know, you've already been through seven, eight games, whatever it would be. But um, playing Notre Dame right out of the gate, first game of the season is certainly not ideal. The last time it happened was the last Ireland game. And Notre Dame destroyed Navy. It was never even a competitive game. Um, now, that was a great Na- a Notre Dame team. Navy was, you know, it was during the Paul Johnson era of, of triple option. It was a decent Navy team. But, um, no, you don't want to play Notre Dame in the season opener. The only reason it was happening is because it was a Dublin game. And now that it's back in Annapolis, I'm sure Ken Niamatololo, he was probably asking – Athletic Director Chuck Gladshock, hey, can we push this back till later in the season? But uh, it is what it is. It's the opener, and that's not going to be a, a great one. Navy, Navy would prefer to open with Lafayette. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or 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 Air, or not, not no Air Force is pretty good. Or maybe like Towson or somebody, you know. Right. Yeah, well, that's sure. what they've done. Well, you know, it's interesting. Navy was an yeah. independent for many years, obviously up until about what has been five years they've been in the American Athletic Conference. So as an yeah. independent, they could kind of massage their schedule. And, you know, they had created what they call the uh, 4 4 4. You know, you have 12 games, you have four that are, you know, you're going to be favored, four that are kind of toss ups, and four in which you're probably the underdog. Well, they joined the American Athletic Conference. That's eight conference games. They've got to play Air Force. Army and Notre Dame, three traditional rivalry games, that only leaves one game open. So that's always going to be Towson, Lafayette, Lehigh, you name it. It's going to be a game that you're guaranteed to win. Um, And the way things have worked out this year, they, they have Lafayette on the schedule. That's who they're supposed to play the week after Notre Dame. And I'm sure they'd rather get Lafayette under the belt before they had to face Notre Dame. 
Well, let's yeah. just talk about this game. Um, what if this game gets postponed because of you know what's going on? You know, with Notre Dame, if they have a lot of players affected by the virus, or Navy, you know, has you know people tested positive, and do they have any flexibility to to move it? Because I know they have Army at the end of the year in Philadelphia. Are you going to play Notre Dame before Army, and then have Army or after Army, and you get the conference title game? Well, no, that's a dilemma, and I think back when we were. You know, I think everyone knew there was no chance this game was being played in Dublin, Ireland on August 29th. So I immediately began looking at mutual dates. And if I remember correctly from comparing schedules, there was really not a good mutual date later in the season. So if this game does not come off as the season opener, it's probably not likely to be played this year. And, you know, it's a big money game for Navy in particular because this is their home game. So they get the gate whatever the gate be, and, you know, obviously there's, you know, TV money, et cetera. So not playing this game in particular would be a big hit. But, yeah, I, I think if it doesn't go as the season opener, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, Bill, uh, thanks for coming on tonight. Matt, do you have any other conversation you want to talk to him about uh, this whole big game? Because this is going to be a big game here in Baltimore, you know, the Washington Metro area. Um, yes, that and also just like a general question. I mean, with all this uh, stuff that's happened with the coronavirus and players uh, uh, getting tested and they're, when they're becoming positive for the coronavirus, in fact, one Notre Dame player already is positive. I mean, do you think that, that this season will start on time? You know, I think college football is going to have to live with a certain amount of positive tests. And – I don't know what the answer is, but the the reality from what we've seen so far is that healthy young men like we see college football athletes being are not in danger from the virus. The key is to prevent them from being a danger to anyone else. So, you know, you're going to have them in isolation situations. The Navy football players come here July 6th and they're going to be isolated amongst themselves. And, you know, from what I've heard, some of these Positive cases have come from bad decisions. Football players who are reporting to school for workouts going then having a party amongst themselves or with others. I don't know. You know but you're going to have to accept some level of, of positive cases. It's going to happen. There's no way you can have large group gatherings and not have someone get the virus. So if they decide that yeah. anyone getting the virus is unacceptable, then they're just going to have to shut down the season because I don't know how you're going to avoid that. Yeah. They just had that tennis player that, um, what's his name? The number one player in tennis. Joker, he was at right. a, uh, he held a, a dance party. A, they're all out partying, dancing. You know, yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah. My mom told me that. I'm like, that's weird. So <laughs> you can get the virus even if you want to go boogie down on uh, Saturday night, you know, <laughs> like, okay. Well, you know? Any contact without a face mask from what we're hearing more and more, it's a, you got to be in fairly direct contact with someone, and you have. To, and if you, if you are not wearing masks, it's when you can spread the virus. So, you know, I don't know how it's going to work with college football, but if there's going to be positive cases, I mean, we've already seen that. What schools have come back have all announced some level of positive cases, whether it be one or ten. I mean, it's going to happen, and you, I think the question is: Do you accept it and move on, or do you have to shut down? I think they're going to do this. I think they're going to do like, you know, we get the medical reports on Monday, like who's hurt from the Saturday's game. They're going to test all the players on Monday. And if we get like six or seven positives or whatever, I think that game on Saturday, it might be postponed because you, you know, you don't know what the other side is. You, know, you don't know who's coming. Like my mother even said to me, I was thinking they should be housing, you know, be in their own house for the whole year. Football players, you know, off the campus, bust them in. But my, my mother goes, what about Notre Dame? You know, what if they didn't have their own facilities? What if, they, if somebody has it there, you know, like comes to the game? Yeah, you know, I said, that's a good point. But you can't you can't test the stuff. You know, you can test it before the game and after the game, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know how they're going to manage it. I really don't. It's kind of a wait-and-see approach. But the early uh, reports are not positive. Some schools brought players back for volunteer workouts, and, uh, you know, some of them are getting – are testing positive. It's – kind of inevitable in this climate. My point is testing positive really isn't that big of a deal provided you 
don't pass it to someone else. So once you test positive, you got to quarantine, self quarantine for two weeks. But you yourself, more than likely, and except for in extreme cases, are not at danger of going to the hospital or you know dying. It, they, the stats are in after all this time of months and months of COVID that healthy, the average healthy young people of what college football players are, are not in danger. I mean, I think almost across the board, the ones that have tested po- positive have been asymptomatic. They're not even showing signs. They wouldn't have known they had it and they weren't tested. So, again, I don't know the answers. I'm not a medical doctor. Um Right, health, health practitioner. I just know that there's going to be positive cases, and I, if you think any positive case is a warning sign that you shouldn't be playing college football, then they probably need to not go this season. Exactly. Well, Bill, thanks for coming on tonight. I know you're a busy man. I hope I wish you and your family uh, be safe for Fourth of July. I know we don't have any fireworks going on, but I know somebody's going to let off fireworks somewhere. Yeah, I'm everybody. sure they will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, if anybody, can, yeah, if anybody wants to reach uh, Bill, you can follow his Twitter handle. It's uh, B Wagner at underscore Cap Gazette. So you can you know follow all his good stuff with Navy football. So Bill, thanks for coming on and have a great Fourth uh, of July. You too, guys. Appreciate you. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right, all right folks. That's uh, our good friend Bill Wagner, who does uh, very good work for the uh, for the. Yeah, for the yeah, yeah, for the um for the folks there at Navy. So it's gonna be a very interesting yeah, interesting uh situation here. So uh Matt, so seven twenty seven Eastern time here in uh Baltimore. Thanks for tuning us in here on Herb Events Herb Defense Sports Radio. I'm Chris Idell and uh uh my uh, partner in crime who normally joins us in the other side of the uh the box there, uh Ewan who is uh, on a mini vacation this week because his brother's in town. So Matt is filling, up, filling in from our studios in Northeast today. So uh, hopefully he's enjoying himself. So it looks like he's having having a good time with his old computer. But anyway, but I um, do want to give you a program reminder real quick. Coming up on July 1st, 7.45 next Wednesday night, you and I will be back in the hot seat. And we'll have... Our, we'll have uh, the coach of Howard University joining us, uh, um, Kenny Blakeney, will be joining us. Uh, Blakeney, who uh, used to play for uh, for uh, Coach K down there in uh, Duke. He's down at Howard University head coach, so we'll, we'll have him on the program um, this coming week. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, Jerry Baconbridge, our uh, good friend uh, who covers the Ironbirds. Uh, with a shout out tonight on the program. Thanks for tuning us in, big man. Uh, let's get back to the program. Let's go out to Denver. You know, let's go out to Colorado Springs, Colorado, where where uh, Colorado State is, and they got a brand new coach this year, uh, Coach Steve Adazio, Matt Chuck and I. We're familiar with him because he uh, he was in Cheston Ill for like eight years. So uh, used to be working with uh, used to be at Temple and used to be at Florida. Yes, he was. And so, I mean, he was a success with uh, Boston College and everything. And so, I mean, I see him being a success with Colorado State. Exactly. Well, let's bring, let's bring in our good friend, Miles Blumhart, who is the, uh, he writes for the, uh, out there in Colorado. Miles, I hope I got your last name correctly. How's everything? How's the weather out there in uh, Colorado? You did, Chris. Uh, actually, I'm in the great state of South Dakota. Yeah, I'm on a little un- unpaid furlough, as that kind of happens in our industry these days. But yeah, I'm enjoying uh, beautiful South Dakota. But I come to you and I thank you for uh, allowing me to be on the show. No problem. Thanks for uh, taking some time. I know it's hard for being a writer and a broadcaster these days with furloughs and all that stuff. So how you didn't keep yourself? How did you keep yourself? Uh, Insane with no sports around because I know we're going to get baseball back in sixty days and you got soccer. You got everybody else playing. You know, how did you keep yourself? Uh, you know, without going watching cat fights like I did. Yeah, it, it is difficult. I mean, when you finally we had some PGA golf. Uh, what well, started a couple weeks ago? At least we had some NASCAR a little bit before that. But yeah, it's been pretty difficult. Um, you know, you kind of try just to get away. And in Colorado, you can. 
um, you know, go out and fish and hike and do all sorts of things. So it's kind of been a, a nice hiatus, but we need to get back to sports. Yeah. Well, you got a brand new coach there, um, uh, Mike Bobo, Bebo, whatever his name, went, you know, went packing. I think he went to uh, South Carolina. And now you brought in Steve DeGazio, who we know around here in the ACC country used to, used to uh, coach Boston College. So how did that marriage come about, having uh, Steve DeGazio go all the way up to Colorado Springs? Well, there's a there's a a, a very uh, intricate Urban Meyer tie. Um, Urban was very influential and instrumental in the hire of Steve Adazio. Um, uh, Steve worked for him down in Florida, um, and there's a lot of ties. And <clears throat> um, so Steve ended up at at CSU, and and I think a lot of that probably has to do with Urban Meyer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Urban Meyer. Yeah. You worked with him and. Florida and, you know, learned a lot from Urban Meyer. So he took all that stuff from, I think, from Florida to Temple, Temple to Boston College, and now he's going to try to bring all that thing back to Colorado State. Yeah, I, I think there's um, I think there's a lot of people who were tr- uh, pretty tepid on the hire. Um, he's mm-hmm. he's certainly gone out and, and, and recruited Colorado, which is not, <clears throat> not known as a, a huge uh, – skill state um but it does produce some linebackers and linebackers but he's re, he's recruited very heavily in colorado um he's also recruited very heavily in texas and california which are um traditional csu hotbeds they have gone away from the mike bobo era where they high uh recruited a lot of sec country um and then um uh steve adazio has also gone you know some some of his uh eastern haunts he's gone there and grabbed a few kids and Right now, very early, CSU is like a top fifty recruiting class. But again, it's it's um, you know it's, it's it's there's not much substance in that, you know, because a lot of these um, power fives haven't recruited where they're going to, and so CSU looks good now. But it, you know, in all recruiting classes, you got to see what's going to happen with the players. So so with with Colorado State having a four and eight record last season, and with them having the new coach Steve Adazio. What will the team have to do this year to make a bowl game? Um, you know, the, the really the first thing they need to do is um, there was a lot of division on the team with uh, Mike Bobo. There was, um, uh, I think the culture needs to change. Uh, Mike um, tried to do that at the direction of athletic director Joe Parker the year before. But after you've been here four years and you've had some, some cultural issues on the team, um, I think that's the first thing. Steve is going to have to get the players to believe in him and his coaching staff. Um, there is some skill, but not a lot on this team. I shouldn't say skill, but there's some skill. Um, the offensive line is a concern. The running back is a concern. Uh, CSU has been, you know, some have dubbed it wide receiver U. We have produced some really good wide receivers, but he's going to have to totally rebuild this team. And, you know, you know, the Steve Adazio template is to do it with a strong running game, uh, a good defense, and that's not what CSU has been in the past. So we'll have to see if that you know if that works. And also, they, you know, Steve Adazio had a good running game of a Chestnut Hill last year. He had AJ Dillon, and I'm thinking another guy. You know, one two punch. Do you have you guys have something similar to that? Because I think that's what Steve Adazio's uh, bread and butter is to get that running game running and to get that passing game wide open. Yeah, no, it's um, it's not our strength right now. The offensive line is not good. Um, there's not a lot of depth there. Uh, he's recruited a lot of offensive linemen, some of which have been um, senior uh, transfers or graduate transfers, so we can get those in there. But again, you never know how those people are going to be. Our running back um, stable is is pretty bare at this point. Um, so I think it's going to be a difficult task because again, I think. Where the skill players are are at the receiver and tight end position, and Trey McBride, who is a you know future NFL player, but it is not it does not match with what Steve has done in the past. Yeah. Man, you got any other questions? Um. So, so how how do you think they're going to go ahead and be able to to compete in their conference? Um. I I think they'll do uh, middle to the lower bottom. You're probably looking at maybe three wins for them this year, four probably at the best. Um, I would be shocked if they get five. Um, unless, 
unless the message that that Steve and his staff delivers um, picks up this team, it's got some talent. Um, but again, there have been so many divides on this team that they've never played as a team under Mike Bobo. He did have some NFL type players, but they were never a team. If Steve and his staff can get them to play at that level, they might press five wins. Yeah. Well, uh, Miles, let's talk about uh, Warren Jackson. I was reading a uh, one of these magazines that's like twelve bucks now at a, at a local supermarket, and uh, I was just reading it. Uh, let's talk about Warren. What type of wide receiver does Warren bring to a Steve Adazio offense? I know you haven't seen it yet because of the uh, and you saw it last year in Chestnut Hill. Can he, you know, turn turn the corner and be one of his top draft picks next year in the NFL? Yeah, I, I think there's two things. Yes, he can. He's not a great separator, but he's a big-bodied player, and um, so he can contest for the ball. He's not going to separate from defensive backs. Um, but, again, he is, um, you know, he's in a mold of some of the other players. I don't think he's as good as, you know, and they've had a number of good ones. They had Preston Williams, Michael Gallup, uh, Richard Higgins. I don't think he's as good as them only because I don't think he can separate but he is good at at high pointing the ball, and I think that's what you know NFL um, you know scouts are looking at. Very good player, very good kid. Um, so, um, but again, you know how are, how is a running oriented offense going to use a person like Warren Jackson? His numbers might not be that good, but I don't think NFL teams always look at that. You know, once you get him into a situation where you can look at him, big bodied kid, good kid. So I think he, he definitely will get drafted next year. Yeah. Real quick, just uh, last question to ask you. Let's talk about this big rivalry game every year, beginning of the year, between Colorado and Colorado State. You, always, you guys always play at uh, Mile High Stadium or you know whatever they call it now. Um, just talk about it because you know, people don't get that respect. That This game doesn't get any respect because it's the first game of the year and everybody's like, you got a rivalry game the first game of the year. Should, normally, a rivalry game should be at the end of the year. Yeah, so – Let's talk about the experience of a Colorado, Colorado State uh, game. Well, I think that shows you everything you need to know about, you know, football in the state of Colorado, right? It It is a thing. It's not the thing. There's a lot of things to do in Colorado uh, in, the, in the fall. So, you know, really, although CU is a rival, Wyoming is the big rival of, of CSU. Um you know, I don't know that how many people are going to have there. The last word I heard is it might, it might be only season ticket holders. So you're looking at, you know, what, maybe 12, 14,000 people in the stands, it, which would be a big blow to a, a, a group of five program like CSU because they have a really beautiful stadium. This would be an opportunity to showcase it. And with COVID-19 out there, they might not be able to do that, which will be a big you know, it'll be a big disappointment because that that stadium would really be rocking for that night. But it doesn't look at this point like that might happen this year. You know, Colorado and Colorado State have both been down for a lot of years. Um, and even though we here in Colorado, we like that rivalry on the national scene, it's just not that big a deal. Exactly. Well, uh, Miles, my parents, uh, you know, had, they moved uh, when they got married. They moved out to Colorado for their first couple of years of their of their togetherness, and uh, they enjoyed Colorado. Except for some, my mom told me a story one day that she went to work. It was thirty two degrees snowing, and by lunchtime it was eighty five degrees, and everybody was going home in shorts. Is that the weather out there? That is the weather out here. You know, of course, I grew up in South Dakota, so anything weather wise would be better than that. You know, the weather's out here beautiful. CU's got a great campus. CSU's got a great campus. But, you know, those teams just cannot consistently um, field, you know, competitive teams in the Mountain West and the Pac-12. And that's that's really disappointing. And, you know, hopefully, and again, we root for CU just as much as CSU because, you know, you want the state to do well. But right now the state of affairs is not good in this state. Okay. Well, Miles, uh, where can people follow you, uh, you know, if they want to get everything Colorado State? Yeah, so, uh, you know, at Twitter, it's at uh, Miles Bloomhart, all one word. Um, we have two beat writers that are, are way more intricate into the, um, you know, the CSU football than I am. You know, that's at Kevin Lytle and at uh, Kelly Lyle. 
those two will be once they're back on board. Of course, they're facing more furloughs and a lot of vacation because we're looking at the fall at you know you know ramping back up in sports and um, you know Colorado.com is our you know website for our um, for our newspaper and uh, but we're looking forward to those guys getting back into the action come this fall. That's cool. Well, Miles, enjoy your uh, mini vacation in South Dakota. I've never been there, but I would like to one day make a, a road trip out there because uh, it seems like it's a pretty cool uh, cool state to look at it, all the cool uh, you know, outdoor stuff. Yeah, if you like rural, this is the place to be. And if you, the best place to be, seriously, is the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore. Um, it's atypical of the rest of South Dakota, but it's beautiful. Hey, you guys take care in Baltimore. And um, you know what, Shaq Barrett? Former CSU, great, is from that area. So you guys take care, have fun, and enjoy the rest of your summer. All right, you too, and have a great 4th of July, and hopefully your family's safe and uh, and healthy. Yep, thank you. Take care. All right, folks, that's Miles Bloomhart, who uh, who uh, covers uh, CSU t- uh, football for the uh, for the, uh, the Rams of Colorado State. Yeah, it's true, Matt. Uh, my mom told me a story that they lived in Colorado, and this is when they first got married. And I know she's probably going to watch this tomorrow uh, on the program, but uh, she went to work. It was like 32 degrees, snowing. You know, winter was terrible. Yeah, it was a terrible morning. And then, like, around lunchtime, it was 75 degrees, and everybody took their jackets off to go to lunch. <laughs> that's Colorado weather, buddy. Yeah, that's what my mother told me. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, uh, so folks, uh, coming up shortly, we have our uh, we have Davis Porter, who talks, who will be covering the uh, the Wyoming Cowboys, their uh, the Colorado State's rival. We'll do some. We're doing some Mountain West teams and some American teams tonight on the program. And next week, we'll do whatever we can, whoever wants to join us on the program. But we do have next week. We have uh, Howard University because uh, the men's basketball coach who uh, will be joining us, uh, Kenny Blakeney, who, if you're familiar to uh, Duke basketball, he played for Coach K back in the uh, mid-'90s, and he is the coach, Matt, down there in Howard University. And the reason why he's coming on, because the Irish and Mike and Mike Bray is coming to Washington, D.C. on Martin Luther King holiday next year to play wow. Howard University in D.C., Wow, that's that's awesome. Yeah, so Mike Ray is very familiar with this area, and you know, you know he, he coached at Damatha and all that stuff. So he was, yeah, you know, he's been he's been in Notre Dame for quite some time. But he wants to he wants to bring Notre Dame's basketball to different places so they could get you know more recruit. I have I guess help recruiting and you know help other schools like Howard and everybody else. They're like you know, like a couple years ago they went to Delaware and played Delaware up in Delaware. You know, we uh-huh. couldn't make. I couldn't make it that day because it was a snowy, snowy day. Yeah. You know, and I was not feeling real well. So, uh, so coming up, we're shortly at seven forty-five. We'll wait for him in two minutes. Um, Matt, where were you? Um, we were supposed to have our friend Ron Snyder on tonight. Uh, he he wrote a book about the Baltimore Stallions, but he had a family emergency he had to go to, but he he will not be uh, available. But he's doing a. Uh, a web seminar this coming Saturday at the uh, online. Let me get to you to see if I can get where I wrote it. Uh, yes, um, a Baltimore Stallion uh, reunion web seminar. Twenty-five years of Baltimore Stallions. They won the Grey Cup in 1995, bud. And uh, wow. we're gonna, yeah. So they're gonna be. Uh, he's gonna be doing a seminar, a webcast. With everybody who was part of that team, and on the uh, here's a real quick before we get Davis on, um, where were you uh, this day in um, 1995, June 24th, 1995? Where were you? Where was I? Well, that's that's a good question. I have to think about that one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I I was in school. I mean, I know that, so I was in right. school. And yeah, I mean that's what I was doing, uh, living living the dream. Well, on this date in June twenty fourth, nineteen ninety five, the Stallions played the Birmingham Barracudas in the Orange Bowl in Miami. 
Oh, wow. And they, they changed the Orange Bowl from normal NFL regulations to a CFL type, you know, field. And the Stallions won 37 to nothing that day. Awesome. Yeah. So a little, little, uh, yeah, I, I've been finding these little tidbits, you know, reading stuff the last couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah. Let me, let's uh, bring in our Oklahoma Cowboys. You know, we're not talking the Dallas Cowboys. We talk about Dallas later. But we'll bring in our good friend Davis Porter with us, who is out there in beautiful Wyoming. Uh, so, Davis, uh, how's the weather there in Wyoming? I have never been there, and it seems like it's been pretty. It seems like a pretty cool place to be. Yeah, it's uh, it usually snows and, and it's windy. Uh, well, it's windy all the time, but it snows about nine ten months out of the year. But today is about ninety degrees, so it's about as hot as it's going to get out here today. So it was it was kind of nice. Yeah. Well, you guys are uh, last year four and uh, eight and five overall, four and four in the Mountain West Conference. Um, I think you had a kid got drafted in the NFL this year. Um, what does the Cowboys got to do to get better? And uh, you know, because they open up September fifth against Weber State. Yeah, I think it really boils down to their, their quarterback play. Um, you know, it's just that they they really haven't found a consistent passing game in the post Josh Allen era. I mean, it's been two years. You know, since uh, since Josh uh, left Wyoming and became their highest uh, draft pick in program history when he went to the Bills a couple of years ago, but um, yeah, that, that's the biggest thing I think. Because yeah, they do they do have some a, a lot of uh, uh, key pieces on defense that they have to replace. There's no denying that. You talked about the draft picks, Logan Wilson, Cash Malouia, both of their starting linebackers. Uh, that's going to be a big hit in the second level of their defense. But, look, this is a team that's got more than 70% of their two deep returning from last year. Um, they've got a really, really good home schedule, assuming that there is a season and none of these none of these games are affected by a coronavirus pandemic. Um, I mean, they, they got Utah, their only pack, or power five opponent coming to Laramie. Uh, you mentioned Weber State, which is a, a really good FCS program. We just went to the FCS semifinals last season. They've got Air Force, Boise State, Utah State, San Diego State, all coming to War Memorial Stadium. So, so the schedule sets up really, really well for them. Um, and like I said, they've got a ton of experience coming back, um, including I think uh, you know uh, six of their top eight defensive linemen off last year's two deep are coming back. Their sack leader is coming back. Their leading rusher is coming back. Both quarterbacks are coming back, but. Um, that, that's sort of, again, that's sort of the issue because the old adage is, you know, if you've got two quarterbacks, you don't have one. And, um, you know, Sean Chambers has sort of been that guy, I, I guess, ever since the end of his true freshman year in 2018. The problem is he hasn't been able to stay healthy and stay on the field. Uh, more of a runner uh, is how he's been used so far in his short time at Wyoming. And, you know, he, he's gotten hurt each each season uh, and gone down with season-ending injuries. So, um, you know, they're, I think they're going to have to sort of reevaluate how they – how they approach it at that position, uh, you know, he, he's he's a big kid, 6'3", 225, and his his running ability is a strength of his. So they're not going to go away from it, but I think he's got maybe you run him a few less times, you know, drill in his head that he's got to be a little bit smarter and not take so many big hits, maybe run out of bounds a few more times because um, he's dynamic in the run game. The problem is, um, you know, he they, they really have – the last two years they failed to complete at least 50% of their passes as a team. Um, and as well as they run the ball, I mean, they got one of the best running games in the Mountain West. That they should really be better and, and really be able to use play action more to their advantage. And uh, they just haven't been able to do it. And, and they're breaking in some new receivers too. Now, when I say new, I just mean some guys that haven't started because they did lose three senior starters there. Um, they've got now they've got some guys that have some experience, like an Aiden Eberhart, Gunnar Gentry, Dante Crow, some guys like that, but. Um, you know, they really need some playmakers to emerge out wide, too. It's been a little bit of a combination of everything, but that's a very long-winded way to say that I think quarterback is really the, the key question and, and really a question, um, you know, of the program right now in terms of the position and what they really have to do to take that next step forward as a program. Matt, you got a question for Davis? Yeah, yeah, David. So, so like with Wyoming having an incredible season last year, they they have four losses by five points. Yep. Uh, one last Tulsa, San Diego State, Boise State, and uh, Utah State, and a loss to Air Force was by double digits. So, how will Wyoming use that momentum to propel them into the twenty twenty season? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of what I was hitting on a little bit earlier because you did mention that the they easily could have been a ten win team last year. 
but they just did not have the offensive firepower because, you know, when you like, particularly against the better defenses that they're going to see, like they did, Boise State, San Diego State, Air Force. I mean, those were some of the three best defenses in the conference last year. And Wyoming, while they ran the ball successfully sort to an extent against just about every team they played, it was much more to a, a lesser extent against the better defenses. And once those defenses shut down their running, they, they had no plan B. They, they had – no passing attack, no balance to to counter what the defense was doing, and you know it's it, it, it you know when you when defenses don't have to really account for one aspect of your offense, it's really easy to defend you. Now Wyoming's really good at what they do and running the ball, and you know that they, they, they practice it all the time. They're they're physical. I think Bart Miller, their uh, new offensive line coach, who came in last season, I think he was probably the MVP of that coaching staff really last season uh, with what they were able to do. Uh, you know, with, with not really having that threat of a passing game and, and, and you know, defense is constantly putting eight, nine, even sometimes 10 guys in the box and then to still turn out 220 yards a game or whatever it was, is, is pretty incredible. Um, so, but you know, you've got to have something to fall back on, uh, particularly if you've, and I've written about this, but, you know, if you're looking to take that next step, if you're Craig Bowl in Wyoming uh, in the Mountain West, because look, they, they've, been bowl eligible four straight years. They've won eight games, three of the last four seasons. Like they've got, he's gotten them to a point where like bowl eligibility is sort of the standard now. Like they've been there and done that. The next step is okay. Are you are you going to take that next step as a real contender in the Mountain West, particularly the Mountain Division, which is where Boise State and Air Force, those teams you have to go through if you want to compete, if you want to win a Mountain West championship, are, are in that same division with you. So um, that's the biggest thing. I mean. Again, they've got some uh, losses. They've got, they've got to replace on defense, but they've been a top 50 defense the last three or four years. And, look, Craig Gold, the defensive-minded guy, you know, a, a disciple there at Nebraska. I uh, was a longtime assistant there before he, you know, got fame and at North Dakota State and eventually took the job at Wyoming. So you don't really necessarily worry about that side of the ball. That's not really going to be their Achilles heel. If, if they just can't keep defenses honest with their passing game and, and actually have that threat – you know, in their mm-hmm. offense and in their arsenal, then it's going to be hard for them to beat the better teams in their schedule. Uh, David, is it because Wyoming is the state school? It's just like Delaware. It's just like, um, let's we'll say, Florida. You know, let's we'll say Texas and all that stuff. Did they get a lot? Of, does Coach Boyles get a lot of pressure from the locals saying we need to be up here, not you know, in the middle of the road? You know, does he does he have like uh, meetings at a uh, frozen food section at the uh, Local uh, market like uh, down in Edinburgh, yeah. Virginia, with, you know, with JMU. You know, what is it? What do they do? What is the yeah, end? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you look at Wyoming from a historical perspective. It's a program that hasn't had a ton of, of, of sustained success. Now they were really good in the in the '60s, and they had a couple of ten win seasons back in the '90s. But consistently, like I don't think they've had. I'd have to double check this, but. They haven't had four consecutive bowl eligible seasons. I think in, in, since the late mid, late mid nineties. I think that's right. But I, I mean, it's been I mean, it's been decades since that's happened. So you look and and, and look at what Craig Bowl has done with this, and it's like, yes, it's amazing what what a coach like Craig has done. What, you know, just when you consider you know just how isolated the University of Wyoming is, how hard it can be to recruit to. An area that's not only isolated, but as we mentioned at the open, you talked about the weather. I mean, it's frigid, man. Like the border war last year here at, that, at, here at, at uh, War Memorial Stadium in Laramie, that's, I mean, it was like nine degrees. I think it's, I mean, I, I was, that's maybe the coldest I've ever been in my life. So, I mean, honestly, I say all that to say it's not easy to recruit to a place like Wyoming. And he's able to do that, not only get players that he offers scholarships to, but bring in walk-ons that he's able to to develop over a four-year period. I mean, he, and he said time and time again, this is a developmental program. But but at, at the same time, when you're bringing in a coach like a Craig Bowl, again, who, who came to fame with the enormous success he had at North Dakota State winning national championships there, you sort of expect this program to be in that upper echelon and compete for Mount West Championship every every two or three years. I mean, he is – he has handsomely played this last season. He was the highest-paid coach in the Mountain West. Now, a lot of that had to do with a $650,000 retention bonus that was part of his contract that he got just for still being the coach this past spring. But, I mean, he's making $1.5 million. I mean, that's pretty good money at Wyoming. Uh, and, and there's expectations, obviously, that come with that. And I think Craig would tell you the same thing. Like, th- th- I mean, they're in his seventh year. Like, 
again, they've proven they can get to bowls uh, under Craig Bull. And, you know, it's sort of it, – now it's time, I think, for them to sort of take that next step and get to a place where they can at least finish in the top half of their conference. I don't think they've finished any better than fourth uh, in the last handful of years, uh, at least since they made the run to the Mount West Championship game in 2016. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's – it's sort it's it's interesting because again this is a program that historically has not had a lot of sustained success. But you bring in a guy like Craig Bowl, you expect again to to get to a point where you can finish in the at least the upper half of your conference or uh, in your division and and compete for a Mount West championship every once in a while. Well, you want to be uh, Davis. You want to have uh, win uh, Jimbo Fisher money. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of hard. Yeah, I think if all we have is paying a football coach eight million a year, I have to start doing some investigative journalism. With that. I, don't, I don't think I'm that's going to happen. I I, I got to say it all the time because I'm a big Florida State fan, and and that kind of you know, cut me deep when he uh, went to Texas A&M just because he wanted more money, and I'm like, why do you want to play against Nick Saban every year, knowing that Nick Saban knows who you are? Yeah, that's like <laughs> yeah. that's like that's like going to your neighbor and he yeah you know, playing basketball against him and he knows how to block your shot. You know, it's like yeah. What's the hey, hey, well, hey man, it, it's a it's it's dollar dollar bill, man. I think I'm, if I'm not mistaken, all, that ten year contract that's all guaranteed for Jimbo, right? I know, I think it is. You know, and it's, yeah. it, it, I want I'm throwing it out there. It's just like up there with you guys with with Coach Coral, <laughs> you know. <laughs> they, they look at you, you know, as money bags, you know, like, you know. Hey, hey, man. I, tell, I, tell people, I tell people all the time, man, like, if you're ever looking for an answer to the question, the answer, however you want to get there, is usually money at the end of the day. Like, what is this about? Probably about money. So. Exactly. Well, Davis, tell everybody your Porter handle is, uh, I have it on the bottom line there, uh, at Davis E. Porter, and uh, – you know, could, uh, keep up the good work in Wyoming, and uh, hopefully you guys – hopefully we have football, and hopefully the weather's good, and it would be great to tune on the ESPN2 on, let's say, around November or October to see a game there in Wyoming, and it's like five degrees, yeah. and we're we're here like it's four five degrees. I'm like, good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's that, that's only one of the problems, unfortunately, that we're dealing with. Now, I, I hope that we get to see some football games in September, but I don't know, man. With all the break – the COVID breakouts that are still happening, I'm – I'm doubting that less and less by the day. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. we got to get by, uh, what, July 22nd? That's when uh, Cowboys and, uh, and and Steelers are supposed to be at camp. We'll see how that yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah, then, that, yeah. then if we know if, if they have camp, that means we're going to be playing football. I think that's the cutoff yes. right there. Yeah, it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting for sure. Exactly. Well, Davis, thank you so much. Uh, I want to wish you and your family to be safe and have a good 4th of July, and we'll we'll talk to you down the road. All right. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks. That's Davis yeah, Porter, who, uh, who covers the uh, Wyoming uh, you know, Cowboys there in beautiful you – know, out there in Wyoming. Yeah, Matt, watching a game on ESPN2 in October when it's six degrees out in Wyoming, that makes me feel like where's well, America? Well, uh, Christian um, – Ah. Well, Chris, remember that time over here in South Bend and everything, and it was oh, no, frigid. <laughs> yeah. I was cold. And yeah, we had, it was so <laughs> cold out there. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You enjoyed it because your team won, and my team got derailed, got destroyed, and uh, I had to take the long car ride back because somebody put us in in Chicago. And I'm not mentioning any names, and you know, <laughs> we had a, we had, I had to listen to Notre Dame post game radio updates. I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, you did. But yeah, that was that wasn't as cold as six degrees, but that was I think in like the 15, 19, 20 degree uh, temperature. So that was that was quite cold. Exactly. Well, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna go to Conference USA. Uh, we got a change in schedule, folks. If you just tuned in. Uh, uh, Rob Snyder who won't be around, won't be able to make it tonight on the program. He had a family emergency he had to take care of. But I do want to give him a little shout out. This coming weekend, um, he's doing a webinar uh, on the on on the internet, um, covering. Uh, he's he wrote a book about the Baltimore Stallions reunion. Um, Twenty five years ago, they won the Grey Cup against uh, Calgary. So they're going to be talking. CFL football with uh, they're going to bring back a lot of these players. Let me bring the uh, the names are going to be back there, Matt. Uh, let me bring it up here. 
Did I keep it on the program? Hold on. Uh, I've lost all the names. Yep, I forgot. But they're gonna have, uh, they're gonna have, you know, you know, our good friend, uh, you know, Mike uh, Pringle will be on there, and you know, and uh, the the owner uh, Jim Smith Spanos, uh, you know, he he'll be there as well. So it's gonna be fun. It's one to four on the on Facebook. Go to his page. He'll put a link out, and you can ask Mike Pringle and uh, Tracy Ham and all those people questions. But in the meantime. Uh, speaking of uh, Charlotte, let's get down to Charlotte, North Carolina, where my friend Ewan uh, normally uh, roams, but this, today he's on vacation. But we'll bring in Dave Scott, who covers the uh, the 49ers of Charlotte. Uh, Dave, thanks for coming on at 8 o'clock tonight. Thanks for filling that hole we had. Uh, how's life in Charlotte? It's just fine, warming up a little bit here, uh, but otherwise it's okay. Thanks. Glad to be here with you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you guys last year... Uh, you know, a good season. You guys went to a good bowl game. You know, I got to say, a, a bowl game, I wish I could go to a bowl game, that, uh, the Bahamas Bowl. Uh, just talk about that bowl game. What was it like going out of, out of the country for a bowl game? Well, you're right. You, you could pick uh, worse places to go than the Bahamas Bowl. Um, absolutely. Um, it was, uh, I, I think it was a kind of at the same time, a, a, a great experience, but also an eye-opening experience for them. They they, it was the first bowl game in, in Charlotte history coming on the heels of their first winning season in, in their brief seven-year history. So um, it was something that was uh, really exciting for the program and, and the whole university. Um, they got down there. They had won five games in a row. Um, we're really on a high. Um, and you go down there and you're staying at the Atlantis Resort, and it's it's a lot of fun, a great week. And and then they got slapped around big time in the bowl game by Buffalo. Um, so it was uh, that I think that uh, was a little bit of a wake up call for them. Coach Will Healy, um, who was in his first year, and 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 you know a lot of what he did, obviously to you know help turn the program around, said he learned a whole lot uh, from that experience on maybe how to how to get a team ready in a, in a, for a bowl and, and kind of the proper way to go about things. But uh, it was, it was a, it was a fun week for everybody involved. Um, did not end up well for Charlotte, but obviously uh, the season on a whole was, was, was an incredible success for them. Yeah. Let's just talk about the uh, Charlotte, you know, the brand new team, the 49ers, you know, they came out well, a couple of years ago, you know, you guys played independent ball for a while. Now you're in conference USA. You know, if, how's the fans? Are they getting ready for college football in Charlotte? Because I know down the road they have the Panthers, you know, at you know, Bank of America Stadium, and they bring more money and, and people there on Sundays. Yeah, well, it's they, they're kind of moving into it. Like you said, they, they started out as an FCS program um, for the first couple of years. And then uh, when all the, co- when the, the conference realignment stuff started happening, Conference USA invited them in, and they had to jump in. So, um that's something that they've been kind of growing into, um, you know, to make that leap uh, so quickly from not even being around seven years ago to in, in the span of three years playing FBS football um, was really a jolt for them. So um, they had some tough times, some rough times, and um, finally uh, last year broke through a little bit. Um, they're still working on, on kind of getting that, community support, um, support around the Charlotte area and the Charlotte region, just because of the, you know, the newness of the sport there. They, they just rolled out a new, um, a, a rebranding program yesterday that, that um, they're hoping is going to help with that, um, with the school logo and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, they've got the smallest stadium in, in, in FBS and, and they haven't really even been able to fill that. But uh, I think the excitement that's around the, the program with, with Will Healy and, and now, you know, a team that's shown they can win um, uh, should start to turn that around. Yeah. Matt, you got any questions for us, David? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, well, Charlotte had a great season and everything. They made a bowl game. So, but looking uh, at their 2020 schedule, uh, Charlotte's going to be playing against Tennessee on September 5th and Duke on September 17th. So what do you think the chances are that they're going to pull an upset of either one or possibly both of those teams? Uh, both of them, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, any time a, a group of five 
team goes to play a, a power five team, it's going to be a challenge. Um, they play actually played Tennessee two seasons ago and played them tough, uh, played them within, um, I think, a touchdown or two um, in the Elon Stadium. And they didn't have nearly the team they have now, um, although I think Tennessee's going to be markedly improved from them also. Um, so it's uh, it'll be a challenge for them. It, it is a tough non-conference schedule. They also play uh, Georgia State out of the Sun Belt, which is which is coming to Charlotte. And um, they're another a program that started up not too long ago, but they've come a long way as well. So their non-conference schedule is, is definitely going to be challenging by the time they get to Conference USA in October. So, well, so what do you think of the chances where that Charlotte can go ahead and go back to uh, back to back bowl games? I think they're okay, and again, I think it's gonna. You know, you gotta you gotta get to those six wins, and and having the non conference schedule be as challenging as it is, um, you know, tough to to get, you know, two or three victories out of them before they get into Conference USA. But I think they'll be competitive in Conference USA in that East Division, um, based on what they did last year. Or so. You know, if they can get four or five wins in the league, that, that would get them back to the bowl. And, and that's what they want to do, in addition, obviously, to, to winning the division so they can play for the Conference USA Championship. That's that's Healy's main goal is, is to, you know, get to that championship game in Conference USA and then to ultimately win it. Yeah. Well, Dave, talk about this wide receiver, uh, Victor Tucker. I was reading in my book here. You know, I got from the supermarket. He's a big uh, 5'11", 177-pound wide receiver from – Miami. How did he get a kid from Miami to come all the way up to Charlotte? I thought he was just that small. <laughs> you know, he, a lot of Miami he, people stay in Miami. Yeah, you know? yeah. He was very lightly recruited uh, coming out of high school. He was a steal, and that 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 came from the previous coaching staff. Uh, Brad Lambert uh, landed him. Um, he is, you know, one of these kids. He's, you know, five eleven. He, he's not that big. He's 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 not incredibly fast, but he runs great routes. Has great hands. Um, and, you know, has a knack for getting open. Um, and he's just one of those guys who kind of makes things happen. Caught a couple of big touchdown passes last season that were really meaningful for the team. Um, um, he, he's, uh, you know, he's the leader of what's going to be a really good receiving core for Charlotte this year. Um, they've got – they're very deep and very talented there. So, um, yeah, he's, he, he's going to obviously be one of the best receivers in the league and just a junior. Yeah. Well, last year you guys played uh, Clemson. You know, I was, we were supposed to go down to Clemson and watch you guys play, you know, but we had some uh, travel situations. But what did, it, what did the team learn playing a team like Clemson, who is the number one team in the country and won national championship? Did it, did it teach them anything? Because I know they lost 52 to 10. Did they, did they learn anything from that? Yeah, I think they learned kind of what it's like to play, you know, under the you know under the lights on the big stage against a team that at the time was ranked number one, um, I think they kind of got an education about about you know we can can we go in there can we can we play well can we can we not be intimidated and I think actually they felt that they they did that even though the, the score might indicate otherwise they I don't think anybody went down there expecting to win but I think they wanted to show what they could do um, they had a couple of pro prospects on that team. Um, uh, offensive lineman Cam Clark and, and defensive end Alex Highsmith, who they thought that if they could play well in that game, it might really help their draft prospects. And they both did play very well. Um, and they got some compliments out of the Clemson players about it. And that helped them, you know, they used that tape and it ultimately helped them both get drafted in, by the NFL uh, last spring. Yeah. Well, David, where can people follow you on uh, Twitter? I put your Twitter handle down. I hope it's right. Dave, David Scott 14. That's you it. Picture on, yeah, you have a picture on your Twitter that's kind of interesting. Where did you get that photograph? It would look like one of those like uh, European dollar bills. Yeah, it's actually a, a picture of a, of a former so- old soccer player named George Best, who's an Irish okay. guy. And uh, he, he was my idol when I was a kid. So, yeah, they put his – I think they had a uh, – some kind of um, commemorative uh, pound note or something in Ireland that, that they put them on. And so I, I put it on there and yeah, I'm using it on my Twitter. That's cool. That's awesome. Well, I, my, my favorite player was Gary, Gary Carter when I was growing up. So I didn't put Gary Carter in mine yet. You know. There you go. <laughs> my dad thinks I, I should be getting somebody from the state of, uh, for Gary Carter. I'm like, no, he only met me twice. That's, that's it. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm not part of your state there, Dad. No, thank you. <laughs> so, well, David, thank you so much. Uh, I hope everything, hopefully your family is well, and uh, hopefully this uh, pandemic goes away, and we'll see some football, hopefully, and maybe even the half season or, you know, full season. We'll see, but, you know, we're ready for some sports. Absolutely, aren't we all? I appreciate it. All right, folks. That's David Scott, who yeah. right Thanks, down there in beautiful uh, North Carolina, where our good pal Ewan is uh, rolling. So, uh, you know, we uh, was we give a little shout out to Ewan and uh, his uh, his brother down there, and they're having a good time. Hopefully, um, program reminder coming up uh, starting July twentieth, Matt. I hope you could get some rest before this because uh, we'll be uh, tackling some some media days live from here from the office. Um, we'll be live 8 a.m. Yeah. on starting July 20th in the morning for two hours. And then we'll be back that night, 7 to 9, to recap uh, what's going on in media days around the country because this year uh, it's a cool thing to do that we're going to sit at home and do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it'll be the first ever uh, webinar media days. Exactly, and we'll see. We'll try to get some interviews lined up with some people and some big names in ACC football, Big Twelve, SEC has their on visual, um, or virtual. You know, like you know, you're going to talk to hopefully Jimbo and and the AAC, you know, the American Athletic Conference. Yeah, so I uh, hope you can join us here on Yuski and Herbie. Uh, stay tuned. We'll give you guys more information when uh, when it comes available. When what we're doing, but we'll we'll be here. That whole week, starting July 20th. So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy that as well. So there's big, big, big uh, football. Hopefully that if we still have me, if we have media day July 20th, Matt, that means uh, we got football. So, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, we are waiting for our special guest tonight, Ed Hearn, former Met catcher who uh, 1986 spent a year with the the Mets, and he was the backup catcher to uh, to my uh, my idol Gary Carter who we talked to last year and he spent and he was traded out to Kansas City in 1987 for a well-known uh, a pitcher who wasn't well known his name was David Cohn so uh, he was traded to say uh, to Kansas City for David Cohn and a couple of players but uh, uh, Matt I was looking do, I was doing some research today because I like to bring up some cool facts uh, on this date in um, you know I think it was like 1979. Guess who's made his major league debut? Uh, who? Ricky ah, Henderson. Ah, Green. Good old Ricky Henderson. He uh, he made his major league debut uh, in day one, game one of a doubleheader against Texas in in Oakland's five to one loss, and uh, he uh, he stole base for, he stole his first base in in the first game of the doubleheader. So uh, was it nine hundred ninety nine or a thousand? You know, the first thousand base that he stole was uh, nineteen seventy nine. So that's uh, very interesting stuff there. So uh, we're is. waiting for the turn to get uh, to log into us. We told him about 8:25. We had a cancellation tonight, folks. We had Rob Snyder who was supposed to join us at eight o'clock. Um, he had a uh, family situation, but he is. Uh, you know, we've been plugging this on throughout the uh, show tonight. Um, he's doing a webinar coming up this weekend. Uh, it's, yeah, go to his uh, Facebook page. Uh, Rob Snyder, and you could, uh, they have a reunion of um, all the people from the uh, Baltimore Stallions who won the Grey Cup back in uh, 1995. And I know my father enjoyed watching the Grey Cup, and I did too. That was a great football team. Kind of stunk when uh, the you know, the uh, Ravens came to town. I'm in my studio here, I'm kind of going off because uh, somebody on the uh, production area, and you know. Took my team away from me. Sorry. <laughs> Matt's probably figuring out. I just lost my. Uh, I just lost my. Uh, lost my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and uh, Chris, who are you referring to? <laughs> uh, our 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 video producer outside of the studio here, who was keeping an eye on on us on the program, and maybe one maybe one week we'll have her on the show. So, so. Maybe uh, we'll see if she's actually paying attention. Anyway, we're waiting for uh, Ed, yeah, Ed Hearn to join us. Well, I have a tomato. I'm just waiting to. 
Uh, and yeah, Ed spent one season in New York City, 1986, with the uh, New York Mets. Now he's a public speaker, Matt. So he does a lot of public speaking around town. Yeah. yeah. So Chris, what do you think about them playing? Um, just playing 60 games. I mean, I know it's not a full season. It's not even a half a season. It's less than a half a season. So what? What do you think about? That? I think it's cool because I was reading today. The Orioles get this: the Orioles are playing um, forty games in the National League East. Okay, all right, forty games in the, in the American League East. Okay, forty games. You know, like they played nineteen with you know the or you know Orioles, Yanks, and Red Sox, and all that. But they're playing ten yep. games against people in the National League East, like the Braves, or Braves, Mets, Phillies, Marlins. Uh huh. So the Mets will probably be here for a four-game series. Or maybe a three-game series, and then then the Orioles will go up to uh, City Field and play them for another four game, and then you'll see them play a two game, a little quick two game series at the end. Yeah, but for me being a uh, a diehard Met fan, that that's pretty good. I think I'll enjoy that. Yeah, but here's my question: Is Matt, are they going to slash the ticket prices, or are we going to be paying you know the same ticket price that we did play for a? Uh, uh, 82 game schedule, and now it's a 60 game schedule. Oh, yeah, you're already paying the same price, maybe even more. Yeah. So it's ridiculous. You know, I think, I think I'll just sit home and, you know, buy the MLT uh, Major League Baseball package on uh, on Fire Stick, and hopefully they have a discount for 60 games. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, nice. be real nice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we're still waiting for Ed Hearn to join us you know, tonight. Um, date 16 Eastern Time, uh, 7 16 Central, 5 uh, Mountain, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us here on on uh, Yuski and Herbie. Um, I'm Chris Idell. Normally, I'm Kirby and Yuski, uh, who is you and McCree, he's on vacation this week. And the guy who's supposed to be in the camera area, what are you doing? <laughs> are you doing exercises? No. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, if you're doing exercises to keep yourself in, in ready to roll, that's fine. Yeah. Nope. Nope. No exercises. Trust me, my exercises are outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so um, you know, you can also, folks, if you listen to our show, um, or, and you can even watch our show right now. Right now, on uh, you can see it on the bottom line there. Yeah, HerbertFanSportsRadio.Webly.Com. Um, you can watch this as is right now. We're on Facebook Live and also YouTube Live. Um, so hopefully you folks can make us part of your uh, our football coverage this year. We're going to be doing a lot of cool stuff this year, and whatever bank account I got or somebody's credit card, we'll figure it out. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we're waiting for uh, Ed Hearn to join us. Hopefully he'll join us shortly. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back on next week, next Wednesday night. Um, what's going to be the uh, with former uh, current Duke, uh, you know, Howard University head coach Kenny Blakeney, who used to play for Duke and Coach K back in the uh, early '90s. I think he was part of the uh, part of the the championship teams that Coach K had. Uh, now he's the head coach there at uh, at uh, Howard University. We'll, we're going to talk to him July first. Next Wednesday night at 7.45, talk to him about this big game between the Irish and the Bison. Yes, the Irish of Notre Dame wow. making a trip down to uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. to take on a uh, MEAC school. Is, it's very unheard of, but I think Mike Bray is trying to bring you know, get some recruiting back into this area for Notre Dame because he uh, did really well back in the days when he first started. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I think he's trying to bring you know, magic back to uh, Notre Dame. And, you know, and with the, with the uh, you know, if you go down here, you get you get some good recruits. So, so it's 8, 819, 820. We're still waiting for Ed Hearn. We'll give him a couple more minutes, and I'll shoot him a message to see if he, uh, he's ready. So, so, Chris, what do you think about this coronavirus, the players testing positive? I, I, mean, I mean, do you think that they're still going to have the college football season start on time, even if they continue to have players testing positive? Well, here's what I think they should do with the college football, you know, football and NFL. In college, I came up with this this week. Put everybody in one building, okay, 
you're sleeping in that same building, you're eating dinner with that same building, you're eating breakfast with that same building, you go to school, you know, you, you just do your schooling in that same building, you're basically in a bubble, okay? And then when it comes to practice or when it comes to uh, games, you bust them back to uh, Notre Dame Stadium. Let's use Notre Dame as an example. Bust them back in, and they they play their game. Well, here's the thing: you test the player before the game, and you test, and then you test the player 72 hours after the game. All right. I think that they need to they need to do that to keep football and sports and all that stuff going this year because this is the new thing, and I'm pretty sure if you have uh, you know, 14 players with an outbreak of, uh, you know, coronavirus 19, your team is not going to be playing that weekend. You know? And oh, yeah. It's sad. You know, and I think they need to, and right now it's, what, June 24th? Next week is July 1st. And yeah, here's what, well, here's, well, yeah, here's like breaking news. I mean, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Brooks, Brooke Kepka's caddy, yeah, he went ahead and he got tested positive. So Brooks Kepka has now with withdrawn from the Travelers Championship this week. And what he's done is he has gone ahead and he said, "Guys, we're doing our own stay at home. No one is leaving." What well, he's having his whole team there with him. He said, "I'm not being, well, I'm not interacting with none of the other golfers. No right. one else. Just, you know, just me and my caddy and my team are gonna be." basically isolated. He has his own workout stuff that he brought with him and everything. So he said the only person that's going to be going out is his personal chef, and they're just going to go ahead and go to the grocery store to get food, and that's it. He said today on ESPN that he does not want to go ahead and infect anyone else, so that's why he decided to withdraw because of his caddy testing positive. Well, that's that's smart. Did he test it positive? No, well, no, not Brooks Kepka with his caddy tested positive. I didn't even think that he tested positive. No, yeah. he doesn't want to get himself. Well, Brooks Kepka tested negative. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a good uh, good thing to do. I think that's what you're going to see. You're going to see quarterbacks like Tom Brady. You're going to see football, baseball pitchers like Kurt, you know, Clayton Kershaw and all those people. If they get tested with the, the virus, and they're going to be you're going to be full and they're going to be on the DL for a while. You know, mm-hmm. and that's going to hurt your your club because you only have sixty games, and you got to win forty of them to get to the postseason. It's not like you have 82, 82 home games, and you get you know you have one hundred and sixty two games, and you could slack off the first couple months of the year. Yeah, you know? the first game of the year is going to be July twenty fourth, twenty fifth, and it's going to be a shot out of a cannon right away. Yeah, you know? yep. yeah. So speaking of cannons, we got our good friend uh, Ed Hearn with us who. Uh, had a cannon back in the back in his days playing for the Mets. He's joining us short right here on Herb Defense Sports Radio. Ed, thanks for joining us. Have a, I hope you're doing fine. How's everything going on in uh, your neck of the woods? Yeah, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Hit the unmute button. Try the mute. Try that. We we, we can't hear you. Try again. <laughs> See if I could do something on my end. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, we can't hear Ed. So yeah, I don't know what's going on here. What's the? Okay, try. Let's try it again. We're having problems. This last week we had we had uh, Ed Lynch on last week, and you know we we couldn't even get him on the air. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he's switching headphones. Yeah. So let's see, you could run it through the computer here. Uh, so, folks, you see Ed Hearn on the program. We're trying to get his voice. <laughs> Just letting you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the <laughs> and my dad wants a refund. Yeah, he told me last week he wants a refund. Yeah. <laughs> like, excuse me. Like, who gets refunds around here? And now we're adding some comedy to the show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hopefully we'll get Ed on the uh, program here. Got to love technology. Technology is the greatest thing in the world. When it works. <laughs> they work when it works, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So 
I'll play you. Maybe I can probably give them a call, maybe. I might probably do the old-fashioned, you know, like ESPN, like we used to do. Yeah, let me see what I got here. So uh, if he hears me, tell him to call and give me a call at four four three. Ed, can you hear me? Okay, call me at four four three five six seven zero seven four six. No. Yeah. Give me a buzz on the phone. We'll get you. <laughs> we'll do the old fashioned way, the ESPN way. Yeah. We're having technical difficulties, guys. Yes, yes, yes. We're gonna still get we're still gonna try to get Ed on. He's gonna give me a call, hopefully. So uh folks, thanks for talking you know, staying with us. This is what Live radio and live TV has. Sometimes you have good days. Sometimes you have bad days. Sometimes you can't even figure it out. You know? So I'm waiting for Ed to give me a call here. We'll do the old-fashioned way. We did this last week with Ed, uh, with Ed Lynch. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, can, you, can you hear me? Okay, hold on. Let me let me text you my number. Let's try the other one. Is that the is that the second end over there? This is that number two call again. Number two. I was getting number two. <laughs> oh, two on the line. Well, gentlemen, I, I have to tell you that I got so excited when you mentioned my cannon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're I army, mean, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I called her a hose, man. Of course, of course, that's what she. That's what she said, anyway. That's um, what she said. Sure, that's right. I'm sorry, well, guys. Thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, uh, just talk about what, what you've been up to lately. I know you were on uh, Howie uh, Howie's uh, podcast a couple of weeks ago. How was that? Ali who? Uh, the guy who does the voice of the Mets. Oh, you mean Jay Horowitz? Yeah. Or who? Oh, yeah. yeah, Jay, sure. I, I've been on so many podcasts lately. I, <laughs> I'm i like, uh, man, it's been crazy. But uh, I enjoy it. I love I love talking to folks. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's valuable to me. Uh, you know, you guys... You guys know my history, I'm sure. I, you know, I blew out my shoulder. I had three kidney transplants. It's, it's been a heck of a ride, but um, you know, I and I began having the opportunity to do uh, keynote speaking. Yeah, that's right. You're a, a, yeah, professional. Yeah. yeah. So the last yeah. 25 years, and and you know, and, and actually being on a podcast or a Zoom speaking engagement is 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 much the same. And and I just enjoy interacting with people. Uh, I, you know, actually, when I, I guess when I came up uh, in my earlier days, I was a little more introverted. Uh, but I think being part of the A sixteen changed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were they were a different club. When I was a kid growing up, you know, you, that was my team growing up in Long Island, and uh, you know, I remember you taking over for uh, Gary Carter when Gary Carter broke his thumb, you know, for sure. fifteen. And you hit your you hit your first home run in Dodger Stadium, right? Against uh, the Dodgers, right? No, I hit my I hit my first home run at home on Father's Day. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, it was um, it was really a cool thing. I had my first start in Dodger Stadium against uh, Bob Welch. I was two for two, my first two at bats, and you know I was leading the league, and I thought I might as well quit now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, hey, I'm done. I got to do two off of Bob Welch, who, who was a Cy Young Award winner. Yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. so that was a great thing. My folks, you know, they uh, they flew out there from Florida, east coast of Florida, and then and, and they flew back on Father's Day, and I hit my first major league home run. And our grounds crew guys were really good about retrieving, you know, balls that were special to guys. And 
I never it never crossed my mind in after the game. Uh, mm-hmm. They they probably traded somebody of value like Keith Hernandez or Gary Carter bat for my baseball, and, but <laughs> they were able to give it to me. And um, I eventually, you know, as after I left the clubhouse and met my folks, I was able to give my father that baseball on Father's Day, my first major league home run. Wow, that's cool. That's awesome. Well, you really? were traded a year later. Yeah, you, you were traded a year later for some unknown pitcher named David Cohn. Yeah, yeah, I, that's, yeah. that was pretty I, interesting. How did that I, happen? <laughs> well, well, you know, my wife just was telling the story the other night that, that uh, there were like three clubs that were, you know, talking about trading for me. And uh, it turned, she's from uh, the South Shore of Long Island. And so um, she was um, a beach girl. And I was from the east coast of Florida, a uh, water guy on the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, uh, here we get traded to Kansas City. And like, she's, she was telling these people the other night, oh, Kansas City, kidding me? Uh, but honest truth, the night that they called, I was, uh, uh, she was with me there in spring training. And we were having John Gibbons and his wife at our apartment there. And we were feeding him snook, snook dinner. And the phone call came. It was Joe McElveen. And uh, so, okay, I got trade, et cetera. And I, I told John later, I said, hey, man, fed you tonight. You got my job, me furniture, whatever you need, man. Just take it. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it turned, and it turned out it didn't work out that way for John. But, um, you know, we, um, I, when, I, when I was talking to Joe Mack, and, you know, of course, he told me I was trade to the Royals. And then uh, so I said, um, yeah, so what would you guys get? Who'd you get for me? And uh, he said, uh, triple-A pitcher. And I'm like, what? <laughs> You're like, who? Yeah. Who? What do you who? mean? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was a little bit of a, t- a challenging thing for me because I felt like, you know, it's great to be, you know, in a World Series in your, your first year, your rookie year, you're backing up Gary Carter, a role model, Hall of Famer. And then, you know, Year number two, the you know several teams and Royals did end up being uh, wanted me to take over their pitching staff, and they had a they had a heck of a pitching staff. So it was, uh, but I was afraid I was losing out on the possibility of you know three or four rings over the next couple of years there in New York because we were loaded with mm-hmm. talent. The other side of that coin was it was a starting job with a tremendous pitching staff, and and you know my role was really to bring them back to the series that they just won like in 85 and you know I was going in the 87 series with Sabre Hagen, Gubaza, Buddy Black, uh, mm-hmm. fabulous young young pitching staff. Yeah. Did you ever meet a guy named Dennis Leonard there in Kansas City? Oh, Dennis is a wonderful guy. Yeah. He was a work he was a tremendous one of the best pitchers in Royals history. Yeah. My my father who did played a lot of rec baseball, he played it he he lived in Long Island. Oceanside, and he had Dennis Leonard on his uh, little league team, and uh, no kid. Yeah, and Dennis was a good uh, good hitter instead of a pitcher. So my dad, you know, told me all the stories about him hitting baseballs and all that stuff. And it's it's pretty cool that he's still in uh, Kansas City. He's still in the front office. He really, you know, well, he's not in the front office, but he he, okay. uh, he he's an alumni, and uh, you know, him and I do a lot of hunting together. And um, he's just a real quality guy, but he was a workhorse. Of a pitcher, you know they don't make them like that anymore. You know, guys go five innings and go, oh, I think I need got my pitch count up to ninety two. Oh, I gotta go. I need a coach. You gonna take me out? <laughs> yeah. What a joke! This game has yeah. really changed, fellas. And okay, now I'm getting myself started on something right okay. here with uh, what's going on in baseball today. Exactly. Hey, Matt, talk to uh, Ed about the uh, sixty games. I gotta go see somebody real quick. My girlfriend's outside and. She needs me real quick, but let me go take a break for a minute. You talk to him about the 60 games of Major League Baseball. Chris, what? You got, you, got, you got a chick instead of me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, he does. But, but actually, I do want to go ahead and uh, talk with you about what you were talking about. How has the game changed? Because well, how has it changed? Well, no. Uh, first of all, I, I believe that, that the athletes – you know, from the days of me growing up, a big fan of the Big Red Machine, Johnny Benson, Cincinnati, Pete Rose, fellows like that, um, uh, you know, where, where you could count on the lineup being the same every day, season mm-hmm. in and season out. 
and it wasn't, you know, a bunch of change. You know, now you, you truly do need a scorecard to, to know who's where and what. Um, I think the athletes have gotten bigger, stronger, and faster. Uh, but I also think the almighty dollar, like in so many other areas of our society, it, it's causing issues. It's a problem. And, um, you know, it, you, you can't pick on just baseball. It's that way in, in, in our whole culture. So, um, you know, and, and we've been through different, different little stints of, uh, you know, things where the ball was, you know, tightened down and flew a lot farther. The laces were changed. So the pitchers weren't getting the break on their breaking pitches. We got steroids going on. Um, it's just, you know, you guys, you have guys, not a lot of guys. I mean, occasionally guys don't run things out, but you got you got guys run, not run things out. Then a guy boosts the ball, oops, and you're still out. You know, it's just, or the secondary leads off the bases. You know, guys are just, you know, it's just, it's upsetting to a lot of us older guys to watch the game play today. And, uh, you know, I, I think the fans, it's, it's sad to read all the commentary on the internet, uh, but I, I totally understand where people are at in regards to what's happened with this negotiation. You know, it's, it's been a tough thing with the COVID come, you know, hitting it at the wrong time and that's happening to our entire country. But, right. you know, uh, a lot of things are changing in our world and I think a lot of mark for the good. So um, I, I just, I, I, I wish baseball the best. I hope they have a great 60 game season I think it could be exciting, could be, you know, fast and furious, but, um, you know, they're, they're playing around with rule changes right now that, that are just absolutely unbelievable. You know, I mean, I heard they were in independent league, they were testing, uh, if you were hitting and a ball gets by the catcher, you can steal first base. Mm-hmm. What? I mean, yeah, I heard that. that's, that's yeah, just that's, ludicrous. Yeah. You know, and, and pitch, pitchers <laughs> having to step off the mound uh, on a pickoff play, you know, you know They've been concerned so many years here recently about game time, length of time. But all of these things are going to make the game longer. I don't yeah. get it. I mean, really, common sense, fellas, um, I think. I, I struggle with it today. Um, you know, really, actually, 1994, yeah. uh, it, it, it turned me away from the game. I was on, I was on a podcast. So you guys don't ask this question now. <laughs> <laughs> the guy says, so, so who are some of the great young players you follow today in the game? And I, uh, I mean, I think I know most of the questions that I'm going to get asked, and I locked up, baby. And fortunately, I, I remembered that the host was a Yankees fan because I had busted his chops earlier, right? So I said, yeah. uh, you know, you know, I think, uh, Mr. Yankee, you've got a guy over there named uh, Judd or some. He, he's a he's a real fine looking guy. And then uh, my mind switched to the Mets, and I said, and I think those Mets across the town got a great, you know, great young guy in the uh, polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was I was bobbing and weaving, man. But, you know, yeah. that's all I could come up with. I, I don't follow the game. Yeah. Uh, and uh, part of it is, in due to, is due to what happened in 94, what's happened several times, and what has definitely happened, you know, right. this year. Yeah. It's uh, – it's sad. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it's sad because here's the thing. I mean, I remember back in the day with Jim Palmer and even before I was even born with Whitey Ford um, and Brooks Robinson was not a pitcher and stuff. Brooks Robinson, a third baseman for the Orioles. Okay, but but you had the players like Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, Harmon Killebrew. Okay, those type of legends that, that played. And, I mean, Whitey Ford, Jim Palmer, uh, uh, had no problems with going – eight, nine innings, a whole game without saying, oh, my gosh, I'm sore after five innings, pull me out, you know? It, it is really sad. It is. Okay, can we yep. move on here, or I'm going to be uh, – I'm going to have to find a girl to come to my door so I can get out of this, too. Oh, uh, yeah. We, I was just going <laughs> to <laughs> – anyway, yeah, anyway. it's, it's just a tough subject, you know, right and now. And uh, in, in, in not only for me, but it's, it's a tough subject for the game. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't defend it, really. Uh, I'm not happy. Exactly. Well, Ed, thank you so much for coming on. And real quick, I know you're good hitters. You grew up 
you played it with was Strawberry and uh, Keith Hernandez and you know Gary Carter. Those were the hitters. You know, they know how to hit the ball. No, you know they were they were great hitters, uh, and, and there was a lot of guys I played against who were great hitters. But we had some tremendous pitching on that team in '86. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, I, I just am so blessed to have had the opportunity to, you know, especially on that '86 team, be a part of that. But to have a career in, in the big leagues, even though it was cut short, uh, mm-hmm. it laid the foundation for a lot of things I've been able to do since then. Yeah. Yeah, you have a book out, right? Real quick, talk about that book you told me uh, a couple years ago. You still have it out? Yeah, it's still there. It's cool. crazy. Um, I wrote this book for my son. Uh, when I began speaking, as, and he was about two years old, and uh, you know, I, ha- I had such serious health problems that I didn't know if I was going to be around when he was, uh, you know, eighteen, you know, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. When, when you know, us, you know, when kids really need their dad, so. Uh, I was moved and, and encouraged by a couple of famous speakers by them saying, you haven't written a book with that story. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I wanted, I wanted mostly for my son to, to hear, have the stories where he could look back. But more importantly, uh, the book is not just about baseball. It's really a book about life. And I wanted him to have, uh, I wanted him to be able to look back if I wasn't here and go, yeah, man, I better think about that, you know? And, it's turned out to be a book not only just for, you know, for Cody, but for other kids and and, and really even uh, adults. It's uh, people have said I had one guy tell me I took two books to the hospital, the Bible and your book. Wow. wow. And your your book got me through what I what I was uh, battling. Yeah. So you know, uh, I'm just blessed to have had the opportunity to play there. Uh, you know, and they say. Uh, you know, I've been to the penthouse, to the outhouse, and now back. And uh, I like I like the things that that uh, there's been a purpose and a plan. It wasn't always my plan, but I think the big guy had a plan for me, and that was to, you know, to, to gain a perspective about life that's a little different. And, um, you know, I, I tell people all the time, it's not at the World Series of your life that you grow and you get better and bigger, stronger as a person. Mm-hmm. It's in It's in the outhouse. Because we all know what's in the outhouse, crap, and everything goes gr- grows in crap. So you know, uh, it's amazing. How many people do you know that are are really good people that haven't been through stuff? So you know, you take the good with the bad, and uh, it's a short life. And so right now, uh, I'm happy to have been blessed by so many opportunities, both good and bad. Yeah, I'm dealing with one right now. It's my brother. He, he, my older brother, he, 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 you know, I know he's done things to himself, but, it's, you know, people love him, you know, and, and I told him, everybody loves you, dude, you know, and they don't want you to go, you know, you know stick yes. around, you know, God hasn't gave you, God hasn't given you anything, I'm not making a religious or anything right now on a sports show, but I feel that like God hasn't told him it's time for, it's time to go yet, I was like, you have something, he has something for you, and he's not ready to give it up yet. Well, I mean, if hey, hey, listen, if I can do anything for, for your brother, if I can send him a copy of my book, yeah, you know, you know, you know, yeah I'll give you, you know. my, my uh, I'll give you his address, and I'll tell him you look for something in the mail. He might, he'll, he'll love it because he, he loved uh, watching the Mets in '86, you know, and he'd probably be glad to bring it. Yeah. Well, listen, listen, is he is he capable of doing what we're doing today? Uh, right now, I think I don't know what he's doing, but yeah, maybe well, I. Can I mean, play. I mean, it's something you know, in another day. Yeah. Another day, I'm, I'm, I'll see if we can get him on, you know, another time. You know, see what his schedule's like. Yeah, yeah see if, if I, I, I would be glad to give him a Zoom call or a Skype or Facebook, and and I do that with people because that's just part of what I do. Yeah. You know, I take 35, 40 pills a day, and the mm-hmm. best medicine I take is when I have a chance to do something for somebody, just like your brother. So, hit me up if you can. If you know, if okay. you'd like. Yeah, to. I'm going to say I'm going to send you my. Uh, my address, and you just mail me the book, and I'll give it to him when I see him. Yeah, no doubt. Sounds good. All right, Ed, Ed, that's that's really nice of you. Really nice. Thanks, Ed. Thank you so much. No problem, hopefully, man. And hopefully, make them feel better and make them feel like people care. You know, well, yeah. Well, yes. Well, especially if I can talk to him one on one, man. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I I've been down the road, man. I mean, I had a loaded three fifty seven in my basement uh, after my first kidney transplant. So, you know. Yeah. 
Wow. And, and, and I've been on deathbed from my health issues. So uh, I've been there, done that. And, and, and I I have what's called compassion because right. I have been there. It's good yeah. being with you guys. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. And I'll send you my address. And we'll take care of it and we'll get him on sometime before the end of the summer. See if he's, a, if he's feeling better. Yeah, but listen, I can talk to him privately. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. be on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good, man. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take care. Keep swinging, you guys. All right. We will. Here, thanks. Take care. All right. That's Ed Hearn, who uh former major leaguer and uh, a good a good friend of the show here. And hopefully that will help my brother out, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's awesome, man. Yeah. So we'll get his book here and. Yeah, I highly recommend people to read it. You know, I haven't read it yet, but you know, it would be good to, yeah, yeah, help uh, help anybody. You know. All right, so, uh, so folks, thanks for tuning in, tuning us in tonight. Uh, and I'm sorry we went a little over our scheduled time, but we had a good time with Ed Hearn, and uh, we had some issues with Ed trying to get on. But thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, you know, please join us next uh, Wednesday night. We'll be back. You and I will be back in the hot seat. We'll have the Duke uh, broadcast, uh, Duke basketball, former Duke basketball player, and currently the head coach at Howard University, Kenny Blakeney, will join us live July first at seven forty-five. If you want to make make us part of your uh, Fourth of July week, so uh, it's very nice of uh, you know, folks. If you want to go run out to the stores to Barnes and Noble's, look up you know, or go online, look up Ed Hearn's book. It'll be great to watch you know, to read his book as well on. Maybe he could help some other help, help people like who uh, like my brother and all that stuff. So, folks, thanks for tuning us in. Have a great week. I uh, hope you guys are uh, safe. And uh, one thing we got to put out there is, yeah, no matter what you're struggling, everybody still loves you. Okay, right, Matt? Yeah, man, definitely. I, I, I mean, no matter what obstacles that you may face in life, know that. You need to know how to overcome them, okay? You need to know how to overcome your obstacles, and that's how your success is going to be defined. So you need to make sure that you overcome them because everybody, I don't care who you are, has positive things and negative things that happen to you in life. It all depends how how you face the negative, the obstacles that you have in life. That is going to determine your level of success. Are so you going to overcome them? Or not. So that's the thing. Don't let those obstacles go ahead and 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 uh, let and uh, bring you down. Exactly. So, folks, have a great evening, and thanks for tuning us in. And uh, little pearls here for you guys on the way out. Have a great time, everybody. Have a great night. Have a great night. <laughs>